So um, I didn't really get anything specific and challenging conversations, no emails or anything else. But what I thought is if I give you a few tactics for general stuff that I know were certainly hurdles for us, um, have been challenges for clients, by the time we get to the end of them, hopefully we've ticked the boxes for maybe things that we've, we can help you with. And if there's anything missing, then that's the time then we can maybe speak about specifics. And as always, if you're going to speak about something that you feel isn't that you want to keep control of, then we can pause the record button. So we're going to continue looking at Chris, uh, listening differently, retouch on what we did last week and then give you a little extra bits and pieces with it. We're going to look at timing. How do you really work out when to talk, when to listen and when to offer a solution? How come we've got, sort of got a little bit of that already with the emotion, but you know, how do we actually move conversations on? And if you've ever given somebody really good advice that's just not hit home, the chances are it's nothing to do with advice. You'll probably find it's timing. So I've got a nice little snippet there that can be helpful. What happens when we're caught in the back foot? When there's a surprise? When, and, and we know that surprises create emotion and emotion impacts on communication. Well, I'm going to offer you a few tactics that we used within our world because we didn't want to be caught in the back foot. Because if we reacted, we didn't want to be robots, but we didn't want to react too emotionally because it's unpredictable. And then we're going to look at influence and influential language. Um, this is actually out of one of the modules I teach, and it's exactly the same exercise as the masterclass. And I thought you might want a bit of fun with this one. It's just how do we influence? And is it influence or manipulation? We need that discussion. How to say no, I thought that might be quite helpful. And then how do you deal with someone or ex explore, we'll call it, but actually challenge unhelpful beliefs? And then maybe you're someone who's kind and appreciative inquiry is all about looking at the positives. Have you ever been in a position where your kindness has been mistaken as a weakness? How do you deal with that? because actually your kindness is the way that you're wired. And to be anything other than that would maybe go against the grain. So I thought, well, look at that list. And we're gonna start with listening. Okay, folks. Listening, um, the, uh, this is a Cathy thing. I tend to teach listening as in um, uh, shopping. And I think, was that the thing that we talked about last week? Did I talk about it as a shopping experience? That was maybe the bit that I missed out. Okay, shopping trolley is there for, for a reason. I would like you to imagine the difference between your shopping experience if you went to a supermarket with a shopping list in comparison to a supermarket without a shopping list. What's the difference, right? There's a smile there from Mandy. I'm guessing there's extra wine bottles in our basket already. <laughs> or there'll be cheese and onion crisps and chocolate um, in Tracy's. So would it be fair to say when we have a shopping list, we go to the supermarket, it's time efficient, cost efficient, you get what you need, you're in, out, back home before you know it. And actually, because you've put everything to a, the conscious part of your brain, you'll probably be able to remember what was on your list probably the next day. Would that be fair? Compare there to no shopping list. Whose shopping experience lasts longer? <laughs> Costs more money. You end up with a few more things in your basket because the supermarkets are exceptionally good at influence and subliminal influence at that. And give you a few tactics for that, by the way, if you ever feel that you are being duped and you're coming out with far more than you ever intended. Um, and actually, you then get home and discover you forgot the eggs and the milk, which is what you went in for in the first place. Right. Listening's the same. If you know what you're listening for, your listening style becomes far more effective and quicker and you will pick up the clues that really matters to the other person far more efficiently than you will if you just browse listen. I'd like you to think of an important conversation you've had in the last week, whether it was a phone home to mum, um, uh, you know, a sibling in crisis or a member of your team needing a bit of an emotional vent. What can you remember now about what was actually important to them? Not the solution, not where we're going to go from there, not looking at the clock and the time limit, but actually what were they really getting at? And I know from some of the things you've already said that you've already used some of that stuff. And in fact, the core emotional concerns that Emma that you explained managed to get you there with it. So if we listen with a purpose, it becomes quite efficient, but be, be aware of this. When we're actually deployed, we never deploy as an individual. We deploy a minimum of two. And if it's a big job, we're there with four or five people everybody's listening. So we have a whole team of listeners 
So whoever is up front as the one negotiator speaking, it's, a, it's likely that they might, list, they might miss something. We've got a backup. It makes us a far easier situation than yours because you've only got your own ears. And what I'm going to say is it can be overwhelming when you start listening this way. Don't be put off by it and just enjoy the knowledge that you're probably going to listen and pick up more clues than you did if you weren't trying to listen this way. So that's the framework. We want to, we want to know what we're listening for. And then we need to listen for, we need to know what we're listening actually for. And this is, I'll bring the slide back up again. This is it, three things, information, the facts, the facts, the figures, the dates, the times, the places. You'll soon find that actually they're the least important. You can always go back and find them somewhere. Emotion, how does somebody feel at that moment? Because emotion is actually going to influence how well this communication, because if they're shouting at me, it means their emotion is high, their ears aren't going to work. So I know already that I'm not going to be able to tell them give, um, very complicated um, details. And then what's important to them is the values, beliefs, needs and wants. And we, last week we had a little bit of an exercise that I wonder whether it's worth going back over again just to refresh. Now, a penny was it yourself that did this exercise. Who did the exercise with me where I said I want the report on my desk by Tuesday? No, maybe we didn't then. Forgive my we brain. Exercise. I think we okay. did. Kathy? Good. Uh -huh. Who's speaking? It's Levette. I don't think we did do that last time. Oh, in that case, please. What I will say is I discover my brain doesn't work quite as good as it used to. There's lots of excuses, I'm sure, in there for it. OK, let's do that then. Who would like to work with me on this then? I'm just going to ask you um, to reflect back what you're hearing from me. That's all. It's not going to embarrass. It's not going to be awkward or anything else. I'm looking for a movement forward. Nicola's iPad too. Nicola, will you be up for it? Yeah, that's fine, as long as the dog doesn't bark in the background. <laughs> Adds realism, doesn't it? That's a good <laughs> thing. Right, folks, I'm going, to, I'm going to demonstrate listening for these three layers. And the first thing I'm going to ask Nicola to reflect back. So the first thing is information. So that is facts, figures, times, dates, places, stuff. It's okay, Nicola, it's not going to be complicated, I promise. Anybody watching Nicola, this is a masterclass in reading emotion right now. Um, it's not a bad one, which is, I feel awkward at being here. I don't feel in control. So what can I immediately say that's going to make her feel in control, which is, Nicola, it's actually not going to be that difficult or that complicated, I promise. I'm hoping that that's enough. And you'll see that the words were short to the point and not big explanations, because people who are emotional won't hear big explanations. Brilliant. Who'd have known, Nicola, you were going to be such a good um, a case study there for a minute? OK, so um, all I'm looking for is the stuff. Now, people who are analytical will be able to recite the stuff. If anybody here is very analytical, facts, figures and all that, you're going to think this is a scoosh. Why doesn't people why don't people pick that up? Anyway, so the first part, um, Nicola, is. Um, I need that report on my desk by Tuesday, please. Tell me what the information, the factual stuff is that you heard there. You want something and you want it on Tuesday. Okay, what do I want? Report. Yeah. So report, desk, Tuesday. That's it. But that's only a third of the message. I'm now going to add an emotional layer in, and I'd like you to tell me what you're reading within the emotion. Just tell me the emotion you feel. Not, don't interpret it, just the emotion. So I go, Nicola, I need that report on my desk by Tuesday, please. What's the emotional story? What emotion are you hearing? Desperation. Mm -hmm. That's fair enough. Urgency. Yeah. Urgency, desperation, and that's all given out by the pace, pitch and tone and probably visual as well. I, I was generally trying to put that across so my face should have matched what I was saying. OK, so there's the two. There's two out of three already. Fabulous. The last one is the one that's the difficult but actually the most valuable because every time someone ever gives you an opinion or a judgment, they are opening a big window into their bubble about what's important to them and what, how they tick with values, beliefs, needs and wants. So what I'm going to say now, Nicola, is, Nicola, I need that report on my desk by Tuesday, please. And I mean Tuesday. I know what your department's like with standards. It'll probably be Friday before I get it. OK. What would you really want to do to this very rude Cathy who delivered that? Give it to her on Monday. 
<laughs> would you be fair to say that the way I've gone about that is quite rude to throw away yes. the mark? Yes. Um, and it probably make you want yes. not to deliver the report, actually, um, even though you have to. So what I'm going to say is let's park the rudeness of it at the moment. And if we look at it, the science of what she just told me that she values, believes, needs and wants, what's important to Kathy? OK, so the throwaway remark is and Tuesday, by the way, I know what your department's like with deadlines, not Friday. I'll probably get a Friday if you've got anything to do with it. OK, so throw away off the cuff remarks are absolute platinum, folks. I promise you, even though they jar the platinum. What do you think um, I believe about you, your department and me? you're not going to get what you've asked for that we're not going to help you or that we're not going to deliver for you yep okay and that's your department what about you you know you're not so convinced that i'm going to be any better at doing that do you think that i'm leading that lack of ability to do yeah and it's probably because you represent the department it's not because yeah. of you individually because i don't know you it's just who you, that you represent the department okay what do you think i value time that, the, that it's going to be there on time you want that report on time so I value time efficiency. Anything else that you could infer? And remember, these are clues, folks, because we're assessing them from our own bubble. And that's why they're clues that we need to check on. But at the moment, anything else in there, Nicola, that you think I value an inference? Mm, don't think I picked up on it. No, that's OK. Anyone else want to contribute with what they think? What do I value? Tracy, thank you. Maybe trust. Mm -hmm. You to trust somebody to get it to you on time. Yeah. And you haven't felt that trust in the past, maybe? Yep. So maybe I need or I value trust, absolutely. Um, time. What do you think my work ethics are like? Would there be an inference about there, Tracy? Work ethics? Um, you're probably very motivated, very organised. Um, you like to deliver when somebody asks you to do something. Okay, you so like expect others to do the same for you. Yeah, so if I'm frustrated about your department not delivering on time, what's the inference of that? And that goes into appreciative inquiry, isn't it? When you've got a negative, what's the flip of that? What's the positive? And the chances are I want and I need, I've got a, a strong work ethic and time is important and efficiency is important. That's clues. We're thinking that. So there's actually quite a lot of things wrapped up in throwaway comments that you can then flip and use to think, OK, wh why would somebody be like that? Remember, last week I said the big question I'm asked is why do people say what they say and do what they do? Because they can and because it works. And also within their bubble, they must think that it's OK to say and do what they're doing. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. So for some reason, Nicola, my bubble seems to say it's OK for me to be that rude with you. There must be something within there that justifies it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing it. And it must get me what I want as well. So how can you use that to your advantage? Well, the first thing that happens is this Cathy needs to know that she's been heard, understood, respected. And here's the little nugget for showing that even if somebody is rude. Three different ways of responding. Take a snippet of stuff from the information a snippet of stuff from the emotion and a snippet of stuff from the values, beliefs, needs and wants or what's important to them. So you can take, you don't have to always do all three of them. You can do it just, you could give it like a shopping list, but I suspect that will sound a little bit fake. I'm going to give you a demo of each of them in a minute. Um, or you can be quite clever about weaving them into your response. So Nicola, thank you for that. I'm going to come back to you about the, the rude Cathy in a minute, but thank you for that meantime. So here we have, how could uh, Nicola respond to Cathy that says, okay, I've grabbed everything you've said. So the information, that's the, the report, Tuesday desk. The emotion, she's feeling frustrated, urgency. Um, uh, yeah, there's a desperation there. Um, and what's really important to her, actually, work ethic, time, deadlines, efficiency. So you might want to go, Cathy, I hear you loud and clear. Actually, we found these phrases quite helpful. I hear you. What you're saying is not lost on me. Um, I'm picking up exactly what you're telling me. Little things like that, re-preludes. 
So it might be, Cathy, I hear you loud and clear. You don't just want that report on your desk by Tuesday, you need it. And I can hear the, the, the frustration that you have. I am guess that's based at our department who's maybe let you down in the past. Um, you know, we, we all, I actually share um, high work ethics or I share efficiency in the way that I work. So I hope that, you know, you'll see that when I get the report to you. So you can see you've just taken a little bit of each. Now, it doesn't have to be war and peace. You don't have to do loads and loads and loads. It might actually be just, um, Nicola, you'd be able to say, Cathy, do you know what? As a, a woman who's, uh, who likes uh, deadlines to be adhered to and has high working standards, what you're saying just connects a chord with me. So don't you worry. That urgency that I'm hearing in your voice, there's no need because the, the report will be in your desk by Tuesday. So you can be quite creative as how to capture, but actually what you're doing is taking a little bit from each bubble. Sometimes you only need two of them, really, um, to, to show that you have heard them. Now, does that mean you have to absorb any rude person that comes your way? Hell, no way do they get to do that. And never should you feel yourself being a, a kicking cushion for anyone. But the timing of when you address that might be important. So there's a boundary to be set here, Nicola, because remember, if nothing changes, nothing changes. If this rude Cathy gets all she wants from being rude and aggressive, she's never going to change that strategy. So how do we go about that? You could do it spontaneously and say, I'm hearing you loud and clear. That report will be in your desk. And you're speaking to someone who has got pretty strong work ethics, who's never missed a deadline please don't come here into the department yelling and screaming like that or throwing away your comments. Now, if you do that spontaneity, you've got to know that there's emotion on both sides and it might not be the best time. Be ready for anything coming your way. But it might be that you think, okay, I'm going to plan this and practice what I'm going to say. And on Tuesday, when I deliver the report and everything is in place, I maybe take that opportunity to say, that's the report, everything's in place. And I'm... Um, I wonder whether it would be you know, possible for us just to have a talk about the way our department works to each other. Straight up, the way you asked for that came across to me as rude and aggressive. The, the, the reaction in me says, go away, I don't want to do it, but that's not going to help our department. So what I'm saying is, can we have a kinder approach with each other? And it might be the first time they've ever seen what they're doing is anything other than direct. My dad, we were out for a family meal at the weekend, folks. My dad was rude. That was it. And he triggered me because I thought, uh, why are you being so rude? He's in his 80s. He seems to have earned the right to do it. And when I chatted to him, oh, dad, I found that really uncomfortable. It was I, I, questions are your friend, folks, always. Dad, was there another way you could have done that rather than having that young waiter running away scared at you? I wasn't scared. I'm going, well, where I was sitting, it looked like that. I didn't challenge him on anything. I didn't say he was wrong. I just said, I found it quite sharp and, to, you know, and, and quite rude. And he went, no, I'm just telling it as it is. Factual. If you, if you faff around, folk will miss the point. I'm going, well, Dad, I don't think he missed the point, but I also think he's run away feeling rubbish. Now, I had that conversation after the event, not at the event, but after it. And I don't know if I made a big difference, but I do know I've probably planted a seed and I hope my dad would have a rethink. I'll ho hopefully chat to him this week. But there we go. It's just setting your stall out. This stuff that I'm coaching you with works most of the time with most people, not all the time with all. It depends how ingrained everything is within them. But I hadn't seen that level of what I would call rudeness in my dad. Now, in my bubble, I'm seeing what he said is rude. In his bubble, he sees it direct and honest. So direct, honest meets rude. Okay, can I tell you, dad, what made me feel that it was rude? I hear for you that it was direct. Again, the proportion of the conversation, is it worth that level of discussion? I think it is. He might not. So at work, is it worth, is there some stuff that you are going to absorb and think that's just them and to, to actually address it is going to be more hassle than it's worth? Or is there something significant here that we really do need to address because there are boundaries to be set? And so there you go, that's it. But out of that, what I'm trying to say is, if you know what you're listening for, you will pick up the clues. 
along the way, things will get in the way, especially if someone is rude or they trigger you or they stand for something that you don't. It makes listening very difficult because we've got a whole load of barriers in our way for listening. And that's it. Now, I could coach on listening far more, of course, but I think if we park that, you are all experienced communicators. You've all been, you know, doing what you do for a while. Um, so I um, want to hit the balance of coaching you from my model without patronising you. So I think that's probably enough from the listening point of view without going into what gets in the way of listening, you know, noisy offices and barriers and things. But that's probably a barrier that's worth identifying. Thoughts, reflections on any of that, folks? Yeah, Cathy, I, I probably would have uh, just jumped straight in at the time of asking and addressed the rudeness, but that's quite interesting that you didn't actually uh, at any time talk, tell them that they were being rude or, you know, you sort of worked it around to a nicer way. Yeah. And, and the thing is, if you tell someone, remember these core emotional concerns we spoke about last week, these five things can be triggered, supported, compromised by a number of things and words are the most common so if I said to my dad who I already know I describe him as a man's man you know he was always the head of the household um, he was the breadwinner it was a very traditional family growing up in the 60s 70s 80s where mum was housewife so dad had a seat when he came home we got out of his seat you know it wasn't bullish it was just what we as our family was it was standards and respect and he was quite disciplined about the way we were and, and actually bizarrely being kind and polite is one of the things he taught us. <laughs> anyway, in amongst that, he's a man with strong autonomy and status. So by me saying to him, Dad, you were rude there. There's a number of reasons he would have argued with me. The you message, which I'm going to speak about shortly, and you were rude. No, I wasn't. Yes, I was. Well, I've just started an argument. So being able to, um, you were rude or that um, dad, don't be rude, don't be that. If you think of it, these languages are challenging autonomy, which is already a high um, value he has. So if you say to somebody, you shouldn't do that, you need to do this, you have to, you must be ready for a reaction because even these words are um, uh, challenging their autonomy and it'll make their emotion change. And when their emotion changes, the avoid comes in rather than the approach. And when the avoid comes in, communication is going to fail. So my dad, dad, I messages, I found that quite, what was it that you thought was direct that I think is rude? How do you think I've got that impression then? You know, that sort of thing. So you end up, what you do have is a bit of a discussion out of it. And I parked it. I didn't want to take it any fear. I'm hoping he's, he at least planted a seed. So thank you. Right, I next. think, can yeah. I just check your audio has got, slightly quieter oh that's because i took my jacket off and my microphone is over here thank you so much you're okay. right lifesaver should have noticed that but thank you anything i need to repeat or was it still okay enough enough okay right that's donna saying get on with it get on with it <laughs> it's okay in a light way I'm telling myself, get on with it. Okay, folks, timing. I've got a little film for you here, actually. Let me go and find it because I want it. There we go. Right. Timing then. When to talk, when to listen, when to move a conversation on. Getting the timing right is as important as a comedian on stage. If anybody has been at a show and the comedian delivers a brilliant line, but it's just not quite at the time, you'll hear tumbleweed and awkwardness, or they don't have the persona for it. It's just, oh, that was awkward. Um, anybody here who's not that good at telling jokes will know that agony. <laughs> and anyone who's really good at it will think, oh, my time is spot on. So in conversation, well, we use emotion as our barometer when to do any of this. And we already know if emotion is high that people's ears don't listen. So we need, to, uh, sorry, people's ears don't work. So we need to listen as they vent until we get that seesaw down and then conversation can go both ways. But that's not at all. Timing. Before you move a conversation to a solution, for example, ask two things. One, does the person feel heard, understood, respected? 
Do they really know that I've grabbed the main crux of what they've told me? And you now have a bit of a formula for that because all you need to do is reflect back a bit of information, a bit of emotion, and a bit of what really makes them tick, what's important to them. Do they feel heard, understood, respected? And does the intensity of their emotion allow communication to flow? I.e., if they're still highly emotional, they're not, like, we can't have a conversation because the seesaw's up. So I need to wait till the seesaw's down, if you remember the slide from last week. So I'm going to show you this film. It's called Not About the Nail. Um, it's used quite often, so I wouldn't be surprised if some of you have seen it. But basically what we have is a lady with a problem, a guy with a solution. And it's a good solution. So how come it doesn't work? And it's all to do with timing. So as you watch the film, think about at the point that he's coming up with this very wise solution, does the person, does the girl, we'll call her Sophie, does Sophie feel that he's really grabbed the essence of what she's saying? Does she feel that he's heard, understood, respected? Has he reflected back a bit of any of these three things? Or is he going straight into telling her what to do? So there we go, right. Share this. It can be a little bit quiet. You may have to put your sound up on this one. We'll see. It's just there's all this pressure, you know, and sometimes it feels like it's right up on me, and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head, and it's relentless and. I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just... Sometimes it's like... There's this achy... I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. That sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just don't try to see things my way. Do I have to keep Okay. Are we agreed that the reason for her aching head, snag jerseys, sleepless nights? is because she's got a big nail stuck in her head. We're all agreed. And we agreed that he's got quite a good idea. Take the nail out of the head. Sorted. But that communication didn't work. How come? It's his timing. That was it. Did she feel that he had heard, understood, respected? Nothing, Penny, exactly. Nothing he did until later said, I've got you. Now, within the police, we used to have that a lot. We would deploy or we'd go to jobs that we had done time and time again, and we sort of got into the way of, well, to sort this, I need to do this, this, and this. Forgetting that the person on the other side is probably their first ever experience. And if we go straight to problem solving because time's against us, expectations, all these other things, it makes us look like we don't give a care. We're just telling them what to do, and actually, it may be in a situation where they already feel out of control, that they don't feel they have, whether they've had a break into their house or their garden's been vandalised, and suddenly it's unfair, they don't feel in control, and then a police officer comes along and starts telling them what to do. It's just, it's emptying more of that autonomy pot rather than pushing it in. So remember, the quickest way to fulfil core emotional concerns in someone is to listen. Listen to understand. And it doesn't take hours. It just actually takes seconds to say, okay, what I'm hearing here then, Sophie, is that you've got a pained head. That's the fact that she was saying. I can see you're upset about it, the emotion. And all you want is a good night's sleep. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. And if you think of it at the point when he went, that must be tough. 
it is he's recognizing it from her perspective and you can see when emotion then drops oh we can maybe get communication going again so if anything from there sort of is ringing a bell with anyone then be confident that what you're doing is probably right, but the timing might not be serving you well, which actually then makes it longer because you think, I've already told you to do that. <laughs> you know, that sort of idea. So, um, yeah, taking the nail out of the head. That's what I do. Um, I, I suggest to my husband, you're taking the nail out of my head. Try not to do that, please. Yeah, I showed him the film. He is a gem, by the way. I don't know how he puts up with me. Right. Any thoughts there? Is that ringing a bell with anyone that might be helpful for them? Yep, Clifford, I'm getting the wee nods from you. I'm going to go to my other page. Oh, half of you are on my other page as well. Lovely. Any chat about that? Any discussions? Makes sense. Your browser down, Donna. We all right? Yep. Okay, folks. So there you go. When to talk, when to listen. When to offer a solution before you move a conversation on anywhere just think do they know i've grasped the big things of what they're talking about and then i can move communication on um, but only if that emotional seesaw is balanced because if it's not balanced it, the communication can't flow so summary high emotion communication only flows one way be a listener and know that you're listening for information emotion and the clues that tell you what's important to them then we're going to be appropriately curious. We're going to be interested. What I'm hearing is this. I'm a, I've hit the mark. Tell me more about that. Explain, describe, all of that stuff. Um, and once they know and the emotion has dropped, you can then move it on. So with Sophie, after we've said, okay, well, all you want is a good night's sleep. And, you know, I get that this is really annoying and that you're hurting. What do you think might help then? So you can see it's always a problem solving frame of mind and we use questions as our friend. What do you think might help? And this is the bit where you might get someone saying, I have tried everything a million times, nothing ever works and it's impossible. Anyone ever have that as a reply to stuff? It's these emphasis. Now your temptation will be, I bet you've not done it a million times. I bet you've not tried everything nothing's impossible at that point folks you're taking the nail out of their head it's too early they don't need to hear it hint if you ever get someone giving you these emphasized responses like never happens impossible a million times all they're doing is emphasizing the importance of that thing to them that's all a nice reply is just this is really important to you isn't it a tag question isn't it makes people agree with you Sounds good, doesn't it, Pam? Isn't it? Doesn't it? It's a tag question, makes people acknowledge. So there we go. Emphasize, if somebody's emphasizing, it's just emphasizing their, the importance of the thing to them. A reply well, is not going to be, you've not tried everything. Instead, use questions going, well, maybe if you could share with me what you've tried, even the main points, let me hear that because I'm wondering whether there's a place for me to try and help you here. Now, appropriate curiosity. What do you think's Kathy, happening, Sophie? Kathy, just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> see, Johnny's got his hand up there. Oh. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask, Kathy, just a quick question. Um, Go for it. I'm sorry, I've missed that. I'm not seeing all the hands, so no, thanks yeah, for that. Know, I love the that. teamwork. Johnny, um, go on. I'll tell you what it is. Like, so if you're chatting to people and they're being openly negative about something that they're doing um, and being more critical on themselves than they really need to be. Okay. I, sometimes what I find difficult is to not acknowledge that. Like it's, it's acknowledging obviously that they're being over critical on themselves, but you don't want to agree with them at the same time because you don't yep. want them to feel as if what they're right in being critical of themselves. But how do, you, how do you acknowledge it in that sense? Um, because some of the times what you want self know here actually is not that bad at all, but then that sort of feels like you're pulling the nail out of the head for them at the same time. It is. And actually, you're also starting an argument. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You are. And it's the same. Um, I had this with uh, fitness. I work with fitness professionals. And um, there was one guy who says, um, a lady came in, and she looked a million dollars, and she tells me she's fat. She wants me to help her lose weight and train up because she's fat. 
And she says, you know what? And I said to her, no, you're not. You look amazing. You look strong. You look fit. You look healthy. And he went, he never, she never came back. I complimented her. And I went, well, you've actually argued with her. So in a very similar way there, it, um, heard, understood, respected. So we'll call her Sophie. And you might say, Sophie, what I'm hearing here is a lot of self-criticism and you've said this, this and this. So you might actually want to bring out anything she specifically says. So you're quoting. It might be helpful to know that that's not the way I see it. But do you know what's important just now is how you see it. What's going on here? How come I can see a positive, capable, confident person and you see yourself differently? Let's talk about you. Talk us through that, please. Help me understand. Help an incredibly influential work because, word because few people will say no to help. Help me work for that. Help me understand that bit because really I don't see it. And listen and explore. Are you dealing with somebody who really does think they're okay but doesn't want to seem big headed? Are you talk, talking with someone who genuinely is got a confidence issue and doesn't think well of themselves? Um, you know, what's the reason for it? And you can only get that by exploring and, and trying to understand from their perspective. And once, the, this is the neat thing about listening, folks. We used to think if we listen to someone, they would then listen to us. It's that reciprocity. I buy them a coffee. They don't let me go until they bought me a coffee. But what we discovered is there's a little bit in between. I listen to them and give them space. They then start listening to themselves before they then listen to me. So there's a little gap in there. So by giving them time and space to actually talk through in a way that maybe they've never had the opportunity before. And just say, talk me through this then. This, this is bizarre. I'm really interested because this needs to be unraveled. And work out where they are, work out the motivation behind it. And then the questions, what are we going to do then? And then if I was wanting to give someone a compliment, I'd maybe ask them and say, would it be a surprise to you to let you know that what I see is a confident, capable person who, and then deliver the facts, nobody can argue with facts either, who delivers reports on time, is in early, does over provides, does this, this and this. I see all of that. What do you make of that? And as quickly as you can, throw questions back to them. That would be my idea. You don't dismiss what they're saying. You accept it. But in a roundabout way, you're also saying what I see is this and what you see is that. We're seeing things differently. How come? Be appropriately curious. Let them talk. They will listen. They'll have time and space. And then they'll start listening to themselves. They might not have any big change in minds there. But believe me, you'll have planted a seed. And given them the reassurance and then some of the information and the facts, the evidence that backs up your opinion. And it's the same if you're doing it the other way. You've got somebody who th thinks they're the dog's bollocks. And actually, there's a big few, there's a few things to be sorted here. It works the other way as well, where you can say, how come we see things differently? Here are the facts that can never be argued with. But how we see them is different. Talk me through it. Anything in there that you feel would work for you? Oh, yeah, 100 um, percent. It's that. It's avoiding that initial confrontation almost of just sort of going, stop being so negative about yourself, that, that sort of way. Um, so it is, it's it's that acknowledgement, the time and space bit, they allow them to listen to themselves. I think something I've never really thought of because I think that, yeah, the, the, the probably, you, you probably do see that, but always the the pressure and you can tell by the way i'm answering this as well i always need to fill the empty space with words i'm quite good at it so it's just taking that time not to and um letting them sort of listen to themselves a wee bit so then they might listen to me a wee bit more when i do start to ask the questions about why we see it differently so no thank you so much you're welcome and the interesting part about them beginning to listen to themselves we only learned that through i don't i couldn't even tell you when it was but it was, remember I said, every job we do, we review. We do a hot debrief there and then, and then we go and review it. And, and the question we asked is, did it happen or did we make it happen? And let's analyze exactly the bits that we feel were helpful. And somebody came up one day and they said, you know what? I had somebody who just sorted it out themselves just because I gave them space. And someone else said, me too. And then we had a discussion. We said, do you know what? It's as if they start listening to their own argument and realize it's rubbish. And you've been able to allow them, give them to time and space, and ultimately the question, what do you think? How come? 
Where does that come from? Tell me more. Explain how that works. Really? How do you feel about that? What do you think specifically going on here? All these little questions are little nuggets that they've maybe never had before. And they then start realizing, oh. So we then just capture that by saying, they, we listen to them, they listen to themselves, and then they might listen to us. So that was sort of where we came from it. We didn't know that either. That was one of the things we uncovered as we did our, our debriefs. Now there was another hand as well. Johnny, thanks for bringing that up. That's helpful. Folks, I'm also conscious maybe it's cup of tea time. We had one more hand. So if we do- It was Sean McGuire. It is, Sean, go on. Oh, you're on mute, sir. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I take my hand down to sort of think and work it out myself, but it was very interesting that um, you're, I was trying to work out that you'd weaved in the core emotional concerns, but not before the listening and the understanding. Uh, and I thought that was, uh, that's very revealing and very, so, so, uh, so counterintuitive because I think too often we, we tend to say to people, yes, you're a fantastic part of the team and we could do this without you. And we ignore that listening and understanding, and even the even just realizing that a compliment can be an argument. Um, uh, so yeah, it was really about that as to when was the appropriate time to start building their uh, uh, core emotional concerns and, and you know addressing them. But they seem to have done that um, almost by making them reflect upon themselves. Mm -hmm. I think it's always responding. I mean, there's no harm in, in saying to your team, you know. You, we've had a busy week thanks very much folks you've done a brilliant job I mean by all means that, that compliment goes in it just depends what the response is I guess but there if the uh, that's you being proactive I guess being the instigator then uh, you know fill your boots with it absolutely essential but that way if you're dealing with somebody who says oh I'm, I'm not seeing myself in a particularly good light or I don't think I'm great at what I do um, they'll probably squirm a little bit just by getting the compliment but it's not going to solve is it a really is it, is it a genuine belief and we're going to touch on beliefs at the moment uh, just shortly about how do you manage a belief what happens when you've got somebody who has a belief that's really destructive they're not going to change that belief by you telling them they're, they're great they're not going to change the belief by you telling them that they're rubbish they're, 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 they're going to have to have an experiential moment to realize something and all you can do is plant seeds there so but thank you I actually didn't quite, I hadn't consciously done the core emotional concern things um, that way. So thank you for highlighting it. Um, some of it is natural to me now. And I, I, I speak in, I don't know, I'm doing some stuff sometimes. So thank you, Sean. That was kind. Uh, Marita. Just very quickly, I suppose, uh, just conscious of that bit about, um, I think a barrier to effective listening sometimes can be if we're preoccupied with thinking, looking for our opportunity to get our solution in. So when we can take the nail out. And I think there's some real value in having that um, core belief that actually the resolution, the, the, the person's well equipped to take the nail out of their own head at the right time. And so that we don't get preoccupied on, well, I'm just waiting now to get me in to get telling you how you can do that. Uh, just to sit in that place with them is, I, I think, really helpful. And that, that's what we would call competitive listening. You're waiting to jump in, even though it comes from a really good place. Um, you're absolutely right, uh, Marita. It's the, the, and it feels good, especially if you're problem solvers, which part of your job is, is let's work out what's not right and put it right. Let's help. And it all comes from good, honourable places, but actually it does get in the way of communication sometimes. So what you've said is spot on. Thank you, Marita. We go to now is a step, it's still connected to timing in a way. And it's looking at, you know, the being caught on the back foot. Really, um, none of us like that feeling very much at all. Every conversation falls into either the spontaneous or the planned category. And being able to identify which one it is and what comes from that is helpful. And if you can control it, because spontaneity always brings with it emotion. And we now know that emotion brings with it stuff that needs managed in order to let communication flow. Planned always has a reason, a motive, a, a lever behind it. Um, um, and within planned conversations, there are spontaneous moments, believe me, but it's still, is it one or is it the other? And there are some conversations that should be spontaneous and happen spontaneously. 
that would be completely wrong to park them. And there are other ones that have to be planned that would be completely wrong to have them on spontaneous grounds. But there are also others that you just can't, you have no control over and actually there's not a right answer. So let me explain it in um, example um, style. So um, Karen, Karen Jenkins, would you mind working with me on this one? Would that be all right? Sure. You're looking all moody in your movie star backlit room there. It's like <laughs> Hollywood. <laughs> so um, Karen, we've been working together for a while and actually for the last six months, you have been giving me a bit of grief saying, Kathy, you should not be cycling into work using that road. It is too dangerous. And I go, well, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Okay, today I've just come into work. I'm in tears, Karen, and I've just been knocked off my bike. And I said, look at me, my bike's ruined. I've got cuts and they didn't even stop. And you know what? The thing is, it wasn't the only driver this morning. Normally they're a bit close, but that one was ridiculous. And I give you the whole crying, the explanation. I'm suspecting the first thing you want to do is, I told you. No, are you okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, but Karen, that's a spontaneous moment. I've come in upset. Is that right to continue the conversation attached to that there and then? Or are you going to say, okay, I can see you're upset. We'll book a time tomorrow to talk about it. What do you think? First of all, I want to make sure you're okay. It's not right to go into that right now. Um, but we can look at it later to see. Yeah. And, and it's not, uh, do you know, I told you so. It's let, let's look at it and let's see what happened. And is there anything we can do to make it not happen again? Yeah. So if what I'm hearing here is that there's a spontaneous part that has to be acknowledged, which is the acknowledgement of how I feel and what's just happened. But the, the part of it that said, actually, are you going to continue cycling there? That cannot be done at that moment. It has to be planned and we reschedule it. Fabulous. OK, um, so that's what we would do spontaneously. And that's what we would do planned. And it should work tickety boo. Right, Karen, um, we've recovered from the bike thing. But you know what? I do a cycle into work in the morning and I go for a wee run at lunchtime. But I seem to have forgotten the art of showering and deodorant, okay? And you're now gonna to have to deal with me as a smelly colleague who's actually impacting in the office because those in the office are now making fun of me behind my back and they've come to you and said, she stinks. When is she gonna get a shower before she comes and sits with us? And that's something you're gonna to have to address, body odor. Anybody ever had to deal with this with colleagues? Oh, more times than I care for. And it's not comfortable, is it? So Karen, is that going to be a spontaneous conversation or are you going to plan it? I plan it. Because okay. the dear only knows what would come out of my mouth if I said it spontaneously. <laughs> <laughs> so you're planning it, but how are you going to break it to me? Is that going to be spontaneous for me or planned for me? So with that one, there might actually be a time where spontaneity could work, but actually the chances are you've planned it. Would that be fair, Karen? Yes. <clears throat> um, and suddenly if we start looking at these in terms of spontaneous or planned, we can work out actually if it's spontaneous to anyone within the conversation, they can only reply from a place of emotion. And if ever you've begun into a meeting, and you think, this is the first time I've heard of this. But the other people in the meeting, uh, they have worked it out. They've planned it. They've organized it. There's sometimes a little bit of a disconnect. And it's an unfair disconnect because actually I'm only hearing about this for the first time. You've worked it out. So there's a, there's a few things within our own values that come out in these situations. So Karen, thank you for your consideration and thank you that we're gonna have a proper chat over a coffee tomorrow about the biking side of things. But ultimately what I'm trying to get here is have a think when you're having a conversation, is this planned or is it spontaneous? And if it's spontaneous for anyone in the mix, then they can only have an emotional response. Now, what happens then when you're the one who's had it sprung on you? And this is the things we would think about within our world because we didn't want a spontaneous thing. 
especially if it was wrapped around um, violence. You know, if you don't get this done, we're going to harm them. If you don't get that done, we're going to do this, that, the next thing. We don't want what comes out of our mouth to be spontaneous. We need to have thought about it before. So we have a tactic and we call it a bunch of fives. Preparing for predictable dialogue. Stuff that maybe hasn't happened yet, but we can reasonably expect will. Well, why wait until it happens and deal with it emotionally and reactively when we have an opportunity to think about it now? And the specifics with the bunch of fives is that we would have phrases attached to that. Um, to the point where I finished negotiating, I had a file of bunch of fives because bunch of fives are handy things that we exchange with each other. Um, I had a bunch of fives for if a demand ever came in for, say, five million and a helicopter. Nobody ever did, by the way. I lived for the day that somebody asked, demanded a helicopter as an escape vehicle. Never happened. But anyway, we had a bunch of fives ready for these. You know, somebody demanding, you know, five million euros. Well, the bunch of fives weren't around the, we can't do that, or it was always wrapped around questions going, 5,000 euros is a lot of money. Where do you think we'll get that from? How much do you think five million ways? Have you ever seen five million? Because I've never done it. What do, what do the color of the notes actually look like? Oh, you want it by transfer. How does that work then? Because governments have safeguards. So we'd have, we'd already have planned all the things around it and then we'd come up with phrases. Now that's okay, within our world, that's the, the hostage stuff, but you can use it for anything. What do you have in your world that hasn't happened that you reasonably expect can happen, think will? You're going to end up with an angry patient at the door. You're going to end up with a rude colleague. You're going to end up with somebody late every day, or maybe somebody, Kathy isn't falling off her bike yet, but she's going to, and let me think about what I'll say to her when she does. And here's an example of one I've just put in. Um, I didn't know what would serve you well, but I've done one for people who overtalk and stop listening. Five different ways. At some point you can anticipate that in an important meeting or in an, you know, at some point someone's gonna overtalk you. Now it might come from a good place, but actually how do you deal with it? And here's five ways I've already thought about dealing with that. And I'll tell you, I've used some of them already. Okay, so let's say um, Emma Greenwood and I are having a chat and, uh, do you know, I don't, get a, I don't get a word to edgeways about Emma. And before I know, I'm hearing all about her work and all of this and I think, well, we've only got 15 minutes of this meeting left and all I've heard is about is seven minutes about her department and we need to get through a few more. Remember, dignity has to be at the centre of every communication exchange. If Emma and I know each other and I can say, Emma, would you had your wished? That's a Scottish term my gran used to use, by the way. Or I'll say, Emma, button it. I've not got over the edge ways and you're eating up all the time. Let me tell you my opinion. If that would work because of the relationship we have, then go ahead and do that because dignity is still at the centre. But if it doesn't, and I don't know you, Emma, how am I going to say it respectfully? And here's one. You know what, Emma, I think we've both got a few things to talk about here. How about we take it in turns? And then I would say, you know, you've, you've spoken about this, this and this. I'd reflect that I'd heard, understood, respected, taken a bit of information, a bit of emotion and a bit of values, beliefs, needs and wants. What that does, folks, as well, is it's the same as putting a full stop. If you're writing a paragraph, putting a full stop at the end of it, you can then change direction of what you're writing. And that's the same as capturing a, a, when you reflect back to someone, a bit of information, emotion and the, the values, beliefs, needs and wants, reflecting back and to show that you've heard, understood, respected, it's the equivalent of putting a full stop on. So I might say, Emma, you know, I've heard what you've said about this, this and your team and how frustrating it is. Um, how about we take it in turns? Um, would it be okay to tell you my perspective now? Um, I find it difficult to hear when we both talk. Look, I'll listen first, you go ahead. And there's a tactic here that it's always better letting the other person talk first because when you are listening, you will pick up clues of what's important to them that you can then maybe use. But if you do have someone who you know when they have the conversations that they're going to steal it all, then maybe that would not be the best tactic. Try and get your opinion in first. I might, know, I might say, Emma, I noticed that every time we mention the shortage of staff or the budget constraints, you're keen to, I put help in there, but it could be you're keen to get you're keen to give me your thoughts. You know, and it's always before I finish saying what I want to say. Can I just butt in a little bit? 
Can I be cheeky and ask to butt in? So you basically find ways of saying different things and you think about them in advance. As a team, I'm not too sure how you all work together, but as a team, if you think, well, actually, here's a few things that worked really well with an angry client. Here, share them. The art is turning that dialogue into something that sits naturally with you. So there's lots of bunch of fives out there um, for sales, for dentistry. Some of the things I have with the dentists is that they look young and they say people have fear when they come in and they see, I maybe shared that last week. I was like, well, think about a bunch of fives that you can say to someone when you realise that their fear is that you're young and you can't be trusted. What can you say in return? Start thinking about that now. Don't let it just happen on the doorstep. So you've got to react emotionally. Think about it now. Talk to your colleagues. Talk to your experienced people within the practice and ask them when you were in this position, what did you do and how did you manage it? And if you think about it, when it does happen, you have a far more grounded and less emotional response to it. So there we go. That's a bunch of fives. You could summarize it and say it's the same thing you do going into an interview. You don't really know what you're going to be asked, but you can make a good guess and you can prepare for it. And then you'll stand in the shower in the morning and you will practice what you're going to say. And then you'll practice something else. And then you practice something else so that you have maybe three or four different things that you can adapt to different questions. That's a bunch of fives. And that helps you stop being on the back foot. Anything to add or share with that one? Okay. Conscious of time. Now, I did mention we're going to speak about influence. With, I, I've got that and I've also got a few other tactics on after this. I think we could probably get all of them done, but I'm going to double check. Would speaking about influence and the model that we use to influence be beneficial to anyone? You think it would? If you have influence in your work, then yeah. Okay, right, let's do it. So first of all, is it influence or manipulation? And this is a discussion that every negotiator has to have. Dick Mullinder, who was, uh, he was down in Hendon, um, a bit of a role model when I was learning um, and very, he's a cockney, very matter of fact, so you can imagine. And he says, Kath, he calls me Kath, he's about the only person in the world that does. Kath, we manipulate folk, get over it. And I go, no, we influence. We influence. The work that I do is for the greater good. And therefore, I'm influencing. And he's going, no, you're not. You're manipulating. And get over it. <laughs> I'm going, I shall not. I shall not. So basically, what we need to do is we influence all the time, folks. And what I mean by that is that we will never change somebody's mind. So you can relax in the knowledge, no matter what you do and what you say, changes people's minds, ever. You don't make people do stuff they don't want to do. What influences is creating an environment that gives people the freedom and the dignity to change their own mind. That's the thing. Now and then, you um, bullying, that's a different thing. It is, you could argue it's influ inf um, influence, but it's actually more in the manipulation. You don't leave anybody anywhere to go and they have to do what you tell them. That's a different thing. We'll come back to that. But in the general terms of persuasion, the art of persuasion is allowing someone else to change their own mind by giving them time, space, dignity, and making it a nice environment to do so. That for me is influence and for the greater good. My greater good, of course, and my bubble might be different than the greater good of someone else. And I'd always in sort of, you know, in terms of hostage taking, I used to say, oh, but what about the bad guys? And then I thought I need to stop that because they're not bad guys in their bubble. They're good guys in their bubble. And I'm a bad guy in their bubble. So let's talk about it just as everybody having different perspectives. So influence or manipulation, manipulation, well, this, the question comes up when we suddenly put tactics around stuff we already do. And once we know the tactics and we consciously use them, that's when the ethics of should I use it or shouldn't I? And that's something that has to sit personally with you. So that's worth saying, first of all. Right, next, I'm going to give you a task. And I'll show you how all the stuff we did last week now builds up into our model of influence. Values, beliefs, needs, and wants are basically how somebody ticks. We get to understand them by, we can make a calculated assessment, we can listen, but basically we work out how somebody ticks. What do they value in life? What do they need? What do they believe? What do they want? And actually, core emotional concerns gives me five things that I know they need already, even if I don't know them. I'm going to 
ask us to go into breakout rooms and I'll create breakout rooms, maybe just fours and fives. And what I'd like you to do is someone in the breakout room, make a list that you can then copy and paste into chat just in shopping list form. So not big, long uh, explanations, just boom, 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 bullet points. I would like you to imagine that as a team, you are going into a courtroom and you're going to persuade a judge to change a point of law in your favour. OK, so you've not, you're not in trouble, you're not going to jail or anything, but in order to change a point of law, you have to get the judges OK. So this is what you're going to persuade him. And it is a him. Picture he's in his late 60s. He is probably thinking about retirement. He knows the world. He's streetwise. He's seen everything, done pretty much. He's, he knows, you know, the real world. And you're going in to persuade him. So what we're going to do to start with is what is important to that, that, sh that um, uh, judge? You might want to say values, beliefs, needs, wants, but actually you can just accumulate it into what is important to him. What is the stuff that makes him tick that I need to take into consideration? Now, if I was to persuade you, uh, Lindsay, say, I'm saying, Lindsay, come on, come with me to a party. Go on, everybody who's anybody will be there. And you know what? They do the best handbags and so-and-so be there. And you know what their wardrobe's like. If Lindsay, um, if something that's important to Lindsay is smart handbags and the best wardrobe and up-to-date fashion, that might be quite a good persuasive route because I am persuading on what's important to her. But if Lindsay doesn't care about handbags, it's a rubbish, rubbish argument. It's a rubbish art of persuasion. So if we go straight into persuasion, it's like taking the nail out of the head. If we go straight into persuasion without doing our homework first about thinking how somebody ticks, we might try to persuade too much of what's important from us. So have a think about High Court Judge. What is important to him? There we go. Happy with the task? I'll give you four minutes as a team to discuss it. Somebody within each room take responsibility for um, doing the um, bullet point list. And when we come out, we'll put it, put it on chat and I'll then tell you where I'm going to uh, take it from, from there. So let's have a look. Six breakout rooms between four and five people in each. We are going to do four minutes and then only 10 seconds round off. Oops. Perfect. Machine is putting you into rooms. I don't know who's with, with who. Acknowledge it and then disappear and I'll see you back shortly. Let's see, Martin, has that come up for you? Okay. Danny, James, Johnny, are you with us? Just want to make sure there's nobody left in the room on their own. I've got three, five, five, four, four. They're maybe away from the computer at the moment. Okay. I'll just pause. Happy, do you wanna, do you okay, so that's everyone back from the breakout rooms, I think, anyway. Yes, they are. And we're going to have a little look at the chat to see the list of what is important to our judge. Hopefully they'll copy and paste easily and it's not giving you more work. An opportunity to have a quick look at some of the messages. Oh, um, bargaining with the devil. You bought the book, Lindsay. Okay. So we have respect, knowledge, keeping things a succinct argument, arguing, arguments coming from credibility, and he's looking for you to be prepared. Um, equity and justice, his experience, his status, absolutely. I mean, even where a judge sits, whether he wants status or not, he's given it because he's on his own high up, isn't it? Um, the ability to make lasting changes. Respect, evidence, time to consider, respect, Time, well-prepared arguments. Standards, feasible, evidence, fairness, credible. 
and the chance to retire on a high. Okay, so a bit of legacy going on there. Brilliant. So we're going to capture all that. Now I'd like to show you a film clip. This film is from, um, a, um, it's a film called Hidden Figures, and it is based at NASA in the 1960s, based on fact. And you had a group of black women who were amazing brains, intelligent, good with figures, engineering, all that sort of thing. And they were not permitted the same pain conditions um, as the white colleagues. So if you haven't watched this movie, I'd recommend it because it's great. There are bits that will anger you. There are bits that will make you laugh and it has a happy ending. So it's quite good. But the scene that I'm going to show you is when Mrs. Jackson, a young black woman, is going into the court to ask a white old judge to change a point of law in her favour. And in these times, and if you think back, if you'd said to someone, could a, a young black woman get a point of law changed? What on earth does she have in common with a, an older, experienced, white high court judge? The chances are he won't change for her. And actually, when she's in the court, what you see as well is within the courtroom, you've got a whole load of white people and any black people are at the corner and at the back. And there's not that many of them. Okay. So there's a whole load of stuff wrapped around the culture at that point in particular. And I would like you to have a look at how she persuades. It is a beautiful monologue. And have a look at everything that she persuades on. How does she create an environment that makes it easy for him to change a point of law? And influence doesn't just come from the words. It comes from all five senses. So the way we look, the way we sound, how we make somebody feel, the way we smell. Uh, I mean, if you think back to me, uh, influence, and I'm sitting there with B.O., you know, nobody will want to you know hang around me never mind the connection and then never mind the influence part but all five senses count and look at what she does the way she dresses the way she moves how she speaks what she says and how much all of that matches the list that you've just made okay that is what we call hooks hampton high school is a white school mrs jackson Yes, Your Honor, I'm aware of that. Virginia, still a segregated state. May I approach your bench, sir? Your Honor, you of all people should understand the importance of being first. How's that, Mrs. Jackson? Well, you were the first in your family to serve in the armed forces, U.S. Navy the first to attend university. What's the point? I plan on being an engineer at NASA, but I can't do that without taking them classes at that all-white high school. And I can't change the color of my skin. So I have no choice but to be the first, which I can't do without you, sir. Your Honor, out of all the cases you're gonna hear today, which one is gonna matter 100 years from now? Which one is going to make you the first? What a beautiful, influential monologue. Who would have said she would ever be able to persuade him to change a point of law in her favour in that culture? And here she did. Now, um, when I was working out whether to put my, um, uh, my work online when COVID started, I grabbed a few friends and family. My dad was in there and everybody was going, oh, that's amazing. Really good film clip. And what I got from my dad was she's manipulating him. That poor man had nowhere to go. And it was just interesting to see the bubbles. My dad's brilliant, by the way. I'm, paint I'm painting him today as a bad man. He's not. He's brilliant. Um, but it was just interesting to see the perspective. He saw things from the judge's perspective and the rest of us were looking at it from her perspective. But if we look at the science of influence, so communication, the law of approach, the law of avoidance, was there an approach? Both of them had cooperation, perhaps from his position, he had no choice anyway, but there was an approach. 
what were all the things that she did that were influential that bought into the values, beliefs, needs, and wants that you've done? Anyone want to kick off with what they noticed maybe in her persuasion? Um, yep, Sinead, I think, go for it. Yeah, I, I think one of the, the start um, things for me was the fact that she moved more into his space so there wasn't that big distance between them, you know, so she could connect better with them. Yeah, and actually, if you noticed, she asked permission. Yeah. May I approach the bench? Autonomy, strong sense of autonomy within a court, a high court judge, definitely. He has to feel in control. She's asked permission rather than moving up. And you're absolutely right. If you're ever going to have to persuade against a group of people, or if you're going to persuade when the whole world feels that it's against you, so you're changing something you know will be unpopular, get yourself close as you can to the person who is influential that who who you, you need to do the business with sort of thing you need to ha you need to manage the business and step back from the others who might have a have a negative impact on your communication and she's done that very neatly because if you think of it from him he's looking out onto a face of white faces and just a few black people at the back by going closer, she's bringing his gaze completely in. So it's like a two-way conversation. So was it cleverly thought done or did it feel natural? Who knows? But it was done. So thank you very much. So that was the first part of influence. Yvette. I think Kathy, what really stuck out to me was she'd done her research. So she knew who she was dealing with. She knew his background. She knew the levers to push to let him know that he was potentially in the same space that she was in his previous uh, in his previous years. Yep, so preparation. A really important part with any influential monologue you have to deliver is what preparation can you do? It's the same again as an interview. It's unlikely you just rock up at an interview and go from the cuff of what you, you know. You probably do a little bit of research to work out who's on the panel, how do they tick, what is the company about, what do the company stand for that I can find a parallel between me and what I deliver that connects to them. So there's a bit of research done there. And in fact, yep, the one thing that she used as a story to connect was the first. And I see that from the room actually. Yep, Lindsay, the first. And she did a very clever thing, which we call verb tensing. You take a situation on a journey and you take it from the past to the present and to the future. So if you think of it, you were the first. I've no choice. I have to be the first. And in a hundred years from now, his legacy, what in a hundred years from now, when neither of us are here, what's going to be important? What's going to make you the first? So she's falling into the status thing there as well, that he wants a bit of legacy before he retires. It might not have worked just the same way, young man, but it definitely worked with him. I mean, it might have, who knows? But that verb tensing, that taking people on a journey is really quite important. And it, if, if someone is in a place where it's not been that good, being able to help them take that journey into the future and possibilities and what ifs is actually quite a helpful thing. So it might be that you're having to persuade your team that a certain change is coming in, but actually we know that this hasn't been good. This isn't a choice we have to make, but actually if we can think maybe even in two years from now, what is this going to look like and how is it going to be? Then, you know, it might be worthwhile. So taking them on a journey, that's, that's one thing. Now also status, she'd done her homework. Imagine if you were on the interview panel and someone that you were interviewing came in and said, okay, I know that you started with this organization when you were 20 and you've worked really hard to, to, uh, to the position that you work in today. And I know that you have high work standards and ethics. How would, good would that make you feel that somebody actually done a little bit of research to know who you are? And she's done that here. And she's hit the balance. She's not gone to the point where uh, she's raided his bins and she knows what he has for breakfast and you know, what his family are called and where they go to the cinema. That would have been too familiar and too stalker-like, but she's done enough and shared enough. So that was pretty impressive. Yeah, okay. Hey, um, Donna, Anna. do you want to come in? Yes, I was just going to say that the, the balance of that, because it could come across very easily as just 
buttering up and he'd clearly had that experience before by going yeah 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 what's your point so you know so, so she, it had to have a point tied to it um but also then the the follow-up to that was you know we're thinking of his legacy and the legacy in law is is relatively easily found or also tying it back to it might be a while since he's been the first so he's maybe facing the end of his career but you're bringing him back to his youth which he's maybe reflecting on um and giving him even a, 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 a literally a blue sky or thinking whereby her aspirations are to get to NASA the entire country at that stage was thinking of the, the race to the moon and so on and so forth and, and it's pulling them into that but I, I can't help without your help so it, it's not just the legacy in law but actually literally into the sky you know that everybody wants to have done their bit kind of thing as well so that that sort of even lower human level but greater human level aspect of it as well to pull them into that yeah it, she's created possibilities possibility for him as well um absolutely that was a really nice capture actually uh, donna thank you for sharing that but other little things how is she dressed and anybody notice the hand on heart a very american thing anyway though um but actually a hand on heart so non-verbal and the thing is, her emotion, what she said and how our facial expressions were and our nonverbal communication all matched. And we know when people are unauthentic that what they say and how they act, because that's the emotion at work, there can be a disconnect. Everything there seemed honest and connected. And I'm going to finish as well on a point with her to say she was actually quite brave. You, all, you of all people should know the importance of being first. And you think, oh, she's sort of given her a bit of a scolding. But dignity is dignity at the centre there. I think she's probably hit it well. But if he's changing a point of law that will be wholly unpopular, he's going to have to trust her to carry that responsibility as she walks into college. And I think she came across as quite a sharp and strong person with her demeanour. She didn't come in begging please I need this for my family I need to do this and it's not fair in the whole world I doubt that would have been influential it's basically whatever you've got I can take it his decision is going to sit on the shoulders of this young woman is she sharp enough and strong enough to carry that and even subliminally she's given out a few that I'm not scared to say what I need to say but I'm polite and I'm organized with it. And I'm, I'm, you know. So anyway, you get the idea. You could analyze that bit of film clip, but that is our um, model within influences that we never think we're changing anybody's mind. We listen for all the clues that tell us what's important to them. And then we use them as hooks. We persuade on what's important to them. And we try to see things through their lens and let them see things that maybe haven't they, they haven't thought about before with a few tactics thrown in. And we call them hooks. The more hooks we have, the more likely we are to be able to have somebody bite. If we don't make any effort to work out how somebody ticks and we don't listen to understand, we go on what's important to us. If it works, you're lucky. And if you don't, you've got nowhere else to go with it. Persuasion will break down. There we go. That's influence there. I'm conscious of time and I'm conscious also that, Levette, you wanted to do a, a reflection before we finish today's session. Um, I've put a whole load of things on the PowerPoint in your workbook and that's out of my Mary Poppins bag. There's more could easily be added. There's some could be taken away. And even though we don't get to the end of the PowerPoint today, don't worry about it because they're just extra tactics. The, some of them are self-explanatory and actually some of them I had a, a look over. We sort of mentioned a little bit of last week, even things like eye messages, no one can argue with an eye message. I get the feeling, I wonder. Uh, nobody can argue with that because it's not them. So there's little bits and pieces there. So as, all, as I did last week, I am happy to stay here for an extra half hour. Anyone who wants to stay and ask specific questions will turn the recording off so you can freely ask anything, even if it's a little bit tickly. Um, but for now, I'll hand over to Levette because I think she wants to round this off and with sort of feedback stuff. And I'm going to say, um, for anybody who has to go, thank you so much. You've been a great group to work with genuinely because you've got involved. You've not left me here just talking at people. I hate that. 
Um, you've got involved, you've given real questions, and that's allowed me to share some of the stuff that's worked for us in the past, and I hope will work for you. So thanks so much for everything you've brought to the sessions. It's been a joy, truly. Okay, Livette, over to yourself. Kathy, first of all, I just want to say on behalf of everyone, thank you so much for these. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the feedback that we've had so far has been brilliant. And what we want now is to maybe capture it. Clifford, I wonder, would you pop into the chat box function for me? What went well in this session? And even better, if, if you wouldn't mind some feedback, this really helps when we're planning these sessions into the future and future sessions to be able to get feedback from you, our alumni. But maybe on behalf of us all, Kathy, if I could give you oh. to say thank you so much. Um, thank you it has really been inspiring and i know that all the information has been really useful so get add into the chat box there what went well and even better if for us and enjoy the rest of the day thank you so much i'll stop recording now